Today we're going to be primarily in 2 Kings chapter 6, if you want to leave your Bibles open there, to a story that's very familiar to, to many of us, and that's Elisha and his servant, and having the servant's eyes open to see this great army of God that's surrounding them uh, for their protection and for their guidance. And so it's a, uh, a continuation of one of the things that we're looking at, particularly this month and this quarter, and that is about God making our eyes and that our eyes need to be open to see just how great and wonderful our God is. appreciate the prayer that, that Trey offered a few moments ago, <clears throat> asking God to help us to see the wonderful things from his, from his word. Our OSH lesson with the young people this week is about Elisha. And uh, Elisha is, is uh, he's different than Elijah. And that was something that really stood out to me a lot in the uh, study this week is that Elijah was, seemed to be much more uh, abrupt, uh, blunt. He seemed to be a, a lot more of a disciplinarian type. And Elisha seemed to be more about restoration. And I thought one of the things that was very significant about that was in the New Testament it says that John the Baptist came in the spirit and the power of Elijah. And John the Baptist was one who was very blunt and outspoken especially when he was calling out Herod in his adulterous marriage, and because of that he was put into prison and eventually beheaded. But he was the forerunner for Jesus, and Jesus was a whole lot more about restoration, it seemed. I don't know if that's supposed to be a parallel that we get from it, but at least it's a coincidence that stood out in my mind. And so Elisha is one that throughout the, the, these early chapters, we see him about rebuilding and restoring what had been lost because of Israel's rebellion and idolatrous practices that there's things like stews that are full of poison and yet he's able to take something like water and flour and, and make it whole again. Then in chapter 5 you have Naaman who is this Syrian commander and he's able to have his flesh restored because he's been suffering from leprosy. Even here in chapter 6 you have this axe head that falls into the water because the people are becoming so numerous there's no place for them to live and they start building this place. But this axe has been borrowed but it falls into the water. So Elijah comes down there and he throws, or Elisha rather, throws a stick into the water and the axe head floats and is able to restore it. And so Elisha seems to be a lot different. That's not to say that from time to time he's not uh, abrupt and very uh, disciplined toward people because there is an occasion where these young men make fun of him because he's uh, bald-headed and he calls these bears to come out of the wood and devour those children because of that. I think there's a good lesson about not making fun of preachers with bald heads from that as well. <laughs> And so uh, some of you may want to take note to that one. <laughs> but Elisha is, is a very significant character in the Scriptures. And this morning when we see him being able to open the eyes of this servant, to see something that is unseen, but Elisha knows it's there, but this servant doesn't. I think there's some very good lessons in that for us that we're going to be looking at this morning. So if you're ready for your three key words, let's hold your notebooks up real high this morning. Okay. Here's your three words, protection, comfort, and guidance. Because as we go through this account, I believe this is what we're supposed to, this is the unseen realities that should give us comfort and, and, uh, and hope as we go through life. That we do have protection that we do not even often consider or even know about. That they ought to offer us comfort. So much comfort that it is able to guide us. We are supposed to be the kinds of people that are guided more by what we do not see than what we do see. We walk by faith, not by sight. That means the things that are in the unseen realm, the things that are outside our physical vision are more important and more significant and there's more things going on there than we often consider. And those are the things that should guide us through our lives. And if we use those appropriately, there are many situations in this life that are visible to us that we'll be able to push through a lot easier. Those are some of the lessons that we're gonna be looking at this morning. So in, in Elisha's life, one of the things that's very significant is that in the account that was read for us, I, I appreciate the reading of the, the scriptures this morning. It was a longer reading. But what it was talking about is how this, this king of Syria has been making these plans to ambush Israel's army at several different places. And every time, the king of Israel is able to avoid being attacked and captured. And he's saying, who is it who's a traitor in my ranks? And they say, it's not that. It's that Elisha knows the very words that you're even speaking in your bedroom. That there is not a place where you can hide where Elisha's not going to know what's going on is basically what he's telling him. 
And he's like, well, where is Elisha so I can go down there and capture him and bring him here? And so an army is sent out there. And Elisha doesn't seem to be the one who is upset and scared about this. It's the servant who wakes up early in the morning. And I think some versions have a footnote or maybe they in interpret what shall we do as we are doomed. But Elisha doesn't seem to have that point of view. It's only the servant that does. And the reason being is because Elisha is what we call a seer. And this is something that the Bible early on ascribed to these people who were the prophets. Go over to 1 Samuel chapter 9. 1 Samuel 9 verses 8 through 10. 1 Samuel 9 verses 8 through 10. This is after Saul is being chosen as being the king. And it says that the servant answered Saul again and said, Look, I have here at hand one-fourth of a shekel of silver. I will give that to the man of God. Notice that. Take note of that. I will give this to that man of God to tell us our way. Formerly, this is the explanation. Verse 9. Formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he spoke thus. Come, let us go to the seer. For he, is, he who is now called a prophet was formerly called a seer. Then Saul said to the servant, well said, come, let us go. So they went to the city where the man of God was. So these men of God who were able to prophesy in former days, they were called the seer because there were things that they were able to see that other people were not able to see. These were people who were constantly, when you go through these early books of First and Second Kings and the battles that were going on, it wasn't just from external forces, but many times it was between these prophets of God and the kings of Israel and Judah primarily the ones of Israel. And as they're going through these stages, there's always this idea that the prophet is the one who sees the reality of things. He sees what's really going on because God has revealed these things to him. He knows what is happening, but no one else seems to listen. No one else seems to want to, to know or follow what the prophet is saying. And so this, this animosity between the kings and the prophets, but the real animosity is between these kings and God himself because God is the one who's able to provide that for them. And so what Elisha is able to do as being the seer is he's able to help someone else see the reality, to see what's actually going on, what is actually taking place at that particular moment of time. And so we see this in this account in verses 8 through 12, that he is seeing things that other people do not. But in verses 13 through 17, we have this servant and that's where the focus is right now. This servant saw nothing but danger until Elisha prayed for him. And I think there's a lot of significance in that because for many of us, there are things that are actually right there in front of our face that we do not see. There's been times I've went into the pantry to look for something and I cannot find it. And I say, Angie, where did you put the thing I am looking for and need most in my life right now. And it's right there in front of my face, which she points out very clearly. Our parents have probably told us many times, if it was a snake, it would have bit you because it's so very clear and evident. But for some reason, our vision gets clouded. And I think there's a really good example of this idea that sometimes we need people to help us see things. We do need to be praying for people to see things, just like Elisha did for this servant. But sometimes what we need is to just sit down and help to explain some things to some people. I think a really good example of this is in Acts chapter 8. Turn over to Acts chapter 8. And you remember in Acts chapter 8, you have this account where the Ethiopian eunuch is going to be converted. But as he is journeying in his chariot, he is reading from the Word of God, and Philip goes to this eunuch who's reading the Word of God, and he asks him a very important question. He asks him if he understands what it is that he is reading. Do you understand what you're reading in verse 30? In verse 31, the eunuch understood and said, how can I unless someone guides me? And so he asked Philip to come up into the chariot with him, and they began to study from the Word of God. And it's interesting that this eunuch understood that there were some things that he was not seeing. He had the verses right there. He had the scriptures right there. 
but he still couldn't see what the scriptures were pointing out. Who is it talking about? Is it talking about this man, or is there someone else that's being talked about in this passage? And so from that passage of scripture, he began to open this eunuch's eyes to what is being talked about. It's talking about Jesus, the Christ, and how he is the Son of God, and how he gave his life for you, and how fulfilled the, the prophecies, this very one that you're even reading, is about Jesus Christ. And this eunuch's eyes were open, and you can see it very clearly when he says this, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? He got it. That light bulb came on and it was clear. His eyes were opened because someone sat down to him and preached to him Jesus Christ. And when he preached to him Jesus Christ, he preached what it was to be saved and how a person is saved from his sins. And so he says, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, then you may. And so he, they went down into the water and he baptized him. And then that unit went on his way rejoicing because his eyes had been opened. It's a very good accounting of, of what it really means to have our eyes open, to see things that maybe we haven't seen before, and to realize that we need help. We know passages like 1 Peter 5 and verse 8 where it tells us that the devil is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. The problem with, with things like this is that often we're, we're too arrogant and we think we already know it all. I know 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. I know it says that the devil's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. What I don't see is how he does that. And often I'm too arrogant to see how he does that and to realize how, I, how he does that. It is very interesting that in 2 Kings chapter 6, if you go back there, how very blunt and plain spoken Elisha's statement is in verse 16. 2 Kings again, chapter 6 and verse, uh, chapter 6 and verse 16. Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Do not fear. The devil's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Do we truly see that? Do we truly recognize that? And when I get up each day, what is it do I, do I see? When I see that passage, if I'm understanding that passage, that the devil's like this roaring lion that's out there, do I focus more on that or do I focus more on the one who can deliver me from that? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting at verse 16. Paul is talking about some of the trials and tribulations that we go through in this life. And notice that in this section, he talks about the fact that our outward man is indeed perishing but our inward man is being renewed day by day. Our light affliction, he calls it in chapter 4, verse 17 of 2 Corinthians, is but for a moment, but it's working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Notice that he says, we do not look. We do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are unseen. The things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. He begins to talk about how we are only living in this tent and this tent is something that's being destroyed in chapter 5, verse 1. And we're looking for something else, a building from God. In verse 2, in this tent that we're dwelling in, that's perishing, that's fading away, we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed in that habitation that's from God. If indeed we have been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has also given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. And this is the point, for we walk by faith and not by sight. We need to realize, just as it was with Elisha, Elisha pulled back the curtain to help this servant see what was really going on. And that's what Paul does in 2 Corinthians 4 and 5 here. He pulls back that curtain to see what's really going on. We know that life is temporary. We know that it's fleeting. We know that all this thing, these things that we're going through in this life, how it, it, it causes us burden and pain and hardship. But do we see the unseen part of that? Do we see what's really going on behind the scenes that God is through this preparing something better for us that this is supposed to cause us not to strive to hold on to this more and more and tighter and tighter to have a death grip on it but to let go of it all to walk by faith and not by sight to see that this process that we're going through is leading to something that is better that God has prepared that I'm dwelling in nothing more than a tent, but God has built for me a, a palace, a city, a dwelling place that is more wonderful than we can ever understand do I see what's going on behind the scenes? Do I see more than just with the naked eye? 
And so 1 John 4 and verse 4 gives us that reality as well, that greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. The devil is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, but you are greater than him. He who is in you is greater than him. Romans 8 and verse 31, it says, If God be for us, who can be against us? And it's a rhetorical question. You don't have to answer it. There's nobody that can stand against us if God is for us. I want us to turn to this psalm, Psalm 34. And notice what David says. <clears throat> because as Elisha told his servant, the ones that are with us are many more than those who are with the enemy. David understood this as well. And David... Uh, not only realized this, but lived this reality several times in his life also. Psalm 34 and verse 4. <clears throat> Psalm 34 verse 4. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all of my fears. In verses 7 and 8 it says this. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. The army of the Lord encamps around. You feel that way? Or do you feel like you're surrounded by nothing but hardship and difficulty? Nothing but discouragements. Nothing but, but trials. Nothing but disappointments. Nothing but betrayal. Nothing but one let down after another. Nothing but just one more burden that you have to carry. Or do you see that you are encamped and surrounded by the army of the Lord? When you wake up each day, how do you face that day? Do you face it looking at all the hard things that's going to happen, all the burdens that you've got, or do you see yourself surrounded by the army of the Lord? And if God is for you, who can be against you? The devil's a roaring lion. He's seeking whom he may devour, but the Lord encamps around his faithful. What do you see? That's the point that we're trying to teach our young people with this lesson. You need to see yourself when you go to school and you hear the kind of weird things that are being taught. You, you need to understand this and see this when you're, when you're around your friends and it feels like you're being overwhelmed because you're surrounded by a group of people who are wanting to do those things that are wrong, wanting to do those things that are evil. You know better than that, but you feel like you're all alone. One of, one of Satan's greatest means of, of destroying Christians is this, isolation. Getting you to feel like you're all alone. That nobody cares about you. So often those who fall away from the faith, these are the statements they use. Nobody cares about me. Nobody reached out to me. Nobody was there for me. Nobody called me. Nobody did these things for me. And at the center of all that is me. And what they did not see, they saw everything by the flesh, even if it was true. So what? What? You are encamped with the army of God, and he surrounds you. So you're going to let little things like that cause you to forsake your God. And believe me, those are little things. You're going to give up eternity because of that. Because Satan made you feel like you were alone. Because you were seeing things only through your eyes and not through the eyes of God. Lord, open his eyes that he may see. If all the world betray you, you're going to give up God because of that? Or are you going to trust in the army that encamps around you? This was a massive army that came out to get Elisha. Elisha was one man, and this massive army comes out there to get him. And that servant goes out there, and he sees this massive army that's there. What shall we do? We are doomed, Elisha said. Lord, open his eyes so he can see. And what comfort do you think it gave him to see that that massive army that was full of chariots of fire, the army of God, was a lot greater than that army that that king of Syria had sent. It's also interesting that the way in which this enemy was defeated, defeating our enemies, is very interesting. St. Kings chapter 5, you have the account where you have this commander of the Syrians, Naaman, who has leprosy. And Elisha doesn't even go out there to, to meet him. He just sends his servant, says, go dip in the Jordan River seven times and you'll be, you'll be healed from it. At first, you remember the, that Naaman doesn't want to do it, but finally he does and he's healed from that leprosy. And you can imagine the kind of, of, of uh, graciousness that he would have felt toward Elisha 
for doing that very thing. In this account in chapter 6, you have a very similar type of way of defeating the enemy in that after he opens the eyes of the servant, he then prays to God that the eyes of this enemy be closed. Verse 18, 2 Kings 6 and verse 18. So when the Syrians came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Strike this people, I pray, with blindness. And he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. And Elisha said to them, This is not the way, nor is it the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. But he led them to Samaria. So it was when they had come to Samaria that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw, and there they were inside of Samaria. Now the king of Israel saw them, and he said to Elisha, My father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? You can see just how excited and anxious he is to rise up and kill these men. But in verse 22, But Elisha answers, You shall not kill them. Would you kill those whom you have taken captive with a sword and your bow? In other words, this would not be an honorable thing to kill these men. Set food and water before them, that they may eat and drink and go to their master. So there, then he prepared a great feast for them. These men who had come to capture Elisha, that the king of Israel wanted to kill, even though they didn't come for him, they came for Elisha. And Elisha sets food in front of them and has a great feast for them instead. And they ate and they drank. He sent them away and they went to their master. And notice this at the end of verse 23. So the bands of the Syrian raiders came no more into the land of Israel. There was a great peace, at least for a while, because of what had happened. It's interesting that, and surprising too. So what was it that actually defeated the Syrian army? Elisha prayed to his servant, let his eyes be open so that he can see this great army that is here from God, that surrounds us, all these chariots of fire. No doubt that they could have come down and destroyed all of that army. But that army never did battle. The Syrians didn't see that army. Elisha did. And the servant did. And it gave them enough confidence, security, that they could offer to the enemy something that the enemy would not expect. Mercy. Grace, salvation, life. He could have done it with the army from God. He could have done it with the Israel, the army of the uh, king of Israel. But he didn't. He did it with food. He did it with kindness. He did it with sympathy. And because of that, it made the enemy say, I'm not going down there anymore. And there was peace as a result. It's only when we start seeing the unseen that we're able to do that. If I only see that this army came against me and they wanted to do battle with me. And so just as it was with Elijah and the prophets of Baal, let's take them down to the river and cut all their heads off. That's one way of doing it. That would get rid of the enemy. And there was times where that was necessary. Or we can do it like Elisha. Well, let's set food before them. Let's have a great feast for them and then send them back on their way. This is the way that's more advocated by the New Testament for us as Christians. And I think this is a command that many of us, I know for me, is one I struggle with as well. But this is a commandment from God that we have in Romans chapter 12 that a lot of us are probably very close to violating if we haven't violated it many times because it is so difficult. It's counterintuitive, and it's not what we would like to do. Let's go to Romans chapter 12 and read these verses. Romans chapter 12 and starting at verse, at verse 14. Romans chapter 12 and starting at verse 14. <clears throat> Romans 12, starting at verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Do you do, you do that? Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. That is difficult. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. 
Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. The faithful of God are surrounded by the armies of the Lord. The armies of the Lord can defeat any enemy. God doesn't need your help. So we ought to, knowing that that is the case, not repay anyone and leave vengeance to God because God will repay. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. It makes it easier for us to be able to do that, to feed them, to pray for them, to forgive them, to help them see what they cannot see. And the reason why is very simple. Psalm 37, Psalm 37, verses 12 and 13. Psalm 37, 12 and 13. It says here that the wicked plots against the just and gnashes at him with his teeth. In verse 13 it says, The Lord laughs at him, for he sees that his day is coming. That's a convicting passage to me. And it's one that goes along with what we saw in Romans chapter 12, is that I should not be trying to avenge myself. I should not be seeking retribution against those who have done wrong to me. I need to be praying for them. I need to be asking God, help me to help them open their eyes to see what they're doing. Just as it was with Jesus, they don't know what they're doing. They don't see it. Lord, it's, what they don't see is this. Your vengeance is coming. You know what they're saying about me in their bedrooms. You know what they think about me. You know how they're treating me. You know what they are saying behind closed doors. You know what they're saying on the way to the church building and on their way home. You know all of that. And you laugh at it because you know, God, their day is coming. I don't, want, I don't need to play a part in that. I shouldn't play a part in that. Lord, that is you. That is for you to do. My part is this, to pray for them, to be kind to them, to be merciful, gracious, and loving toward them. That's my role in that. But if I don't see what is unseen, what's going on behind the scenes, I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to find the strength. So I need to be able to understand that our enemy's plans are, are seen by God and that our enemies are outnumbered by God and that our enemies can actually be defeated by something as simple as love and kindness. And that's God's means of defeating our enemies. So the question I'm going to leave with you this morning is this one. Is, are you comforted by what you can now see? By knowing these things, does it help you understand a little bit more about even though you may be going through whatever it is that you're going through, that God has not forsaken you, that God is still there. But look at the things that are going on behind the scenes. Look at the things that are, are, are not seen with the, the naked eye, but through the eye of faith. And see that your reward is much greater than anything that you might lose here. There's so many more important things going on than we realize. So I hope this has been encouraging to you. If you're not a Christian this morning, you can be. If you need to be a child of God this morning, the waters of baptism are ready for any who believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And just like the Ethiopian eunuch, see, here's water. It's right there. The answer's been here all the time. But if you now see it and are ready to take part in that, we want to help you. If we can help in any way, please come as we stand and sing.